this will be accessible to you later. Um, my name is Carter Collins, and uh, can you hear me now? Hopefully, you guys can hear me. Um, Carter, it's Carrie. I can hear you, no problem. Great. So glad. That's perfect. Um, someone just chatted me and said they couldn't, so I'm glad that you can. Um, all right, guys, my name is Carter Collins, and I um, am here with you today on behalf of Finkelstein and Partners New York Injury Attorneys. And I'm really excited to be talking to you about COVID and the COVID vaccines. Um, my background is that I'm a nurse. I have a bachelor's of science in nursing and I'm a current registered nurse. I worked in the hospital for, um, for a long time. And I also worked in some clinics, in some high risk clinics um, that served a high risk and low income population particularly. And then I sort of shifted over into a fitness and wellness background, um, that sector. So it's really exciting. Um, this is an exciting opportunity to sort of bridge those two um, passions of mine in the wellness part and um, and in the in the in the total um, in the medical part as well. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to jump in and start talking about what COVID is, what vaccinations are, and then we'll talk specifically about COVID vaccinations, because I think it's helpful to have a little bit of background information to be able to understand what the COVID vaccine is exactly. Um, if you guys have questions as we go, please feel free to type them in the chat. I can see things a lot better in the chat and answer them as we go than I can in the Q&A. So if you could just type them in the chat, that would be spectacular. Um, all right, so let's let's start. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about how vac the vaccine process works, what we know about vaccines, um, and, and action steps to take. The action steps really are going to be um, particular to your local area, but we'll definitely hit on that as well. So before we start talking about the vaccine process, I want to talk to you a little bit about your immune system and just generally how it works, um, because that is how we really can understand how vaccinations work. I think vaccinations and the decision to get vaccinated versus not get vaccinated for anything um, outside of just COVID is that it's a very personal decision that you need to make that based on all of the facts that you know um, and not on misinformation. So what I'm going to try to explain to you now is factually how your immune system works and how these vaccines actually work, their mechanism of actions, so that you can have the most accurate and up-to-date information to be able to make that personal decision for you. I think there are lots of reasons that people make a decision to vaccinate, and it might be to protect their families or to, um, to, to protect themselves, to be able to see friends again, to be able to get life that's back to somewhat normal and new normal, as people are calling it. Um, there are lots of reasons, uh, and community, you know, herd immunity and community awareness is another good one too. Um, there are lots of reasons that people choose. So understanding the facts can help you if you're already in the camp of I'm getting vaccinated and everyone should. It can help you be able to talk to people in a way that they'll understand why or how they should make that personal decision as well. So your immune system from a 3000 foot view works where when an injury occurs, so anything from cutting your finger to um, a foreign invader that's found like a bacteria or a virus, your body launches a big inflammatory response to, to, to any of that. Even if it's a tiny little cut, it's why you kind of feel your heartbeat and you feel redness kind of right at your fingertip if you cut it with a knife, even, even a little bit or a paper cut. Um, it's because your body is mounting an inflammatory response to that location. And when you're exposed to a virus or other foreign invader, your body um, mounts that big inflammatory response inside of your body. That's when you feel um, feverish, chills, uh, muscle aches, that kind of thing. It's from that inflammatory response. So inflammation isn't always bad, right? It's sometimes a good thing because it's helping to fight off those foreign invaders and heal injuries and mop up the debris from, from the cellular waste. 
Um, there are lots of cells that work together in your immune system, um, like white blood cells, leukocytes, phagocytes. Um, phagocytes are kind of like Pac-Man. They come along and they chew up the bad stuff um, and get rid of it. They chew up the invading organisms. You have neutrophils, which sometimes if you go to the doctor when you don't feel well and they draw blood, if you have an elevated neutrophil count, that means that you've been exposed to a bacteria and that your doctor will probably prescribe some antibiotics for you if your neutrophil count is elevated. If your neutrophil count is not elevated, it means that you probably have a virus and not a bacterial infection. So there's lots of different types of cells that sort of work together to be able to, to mount this inflammatory response. The big ones that I want to tell you about today are B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. So these are types of white blood cells that help this, that, that are generated when your body mounts this inflammatory response. So the B lymphocytes are kind of like the body's military intelligence system. They find the targets and then they send in defenses to lock in on those targets. The T lymphocytes are kind of like soldiers. They destroy the foreign invaders. Um, so while we're, we develop, we have an adaptive immune system. That's part of our immune system that we develop over the course of our lifetime. Um, and it starts when you're really small and you get vaccinated as a baby. Um, that's, that's really developing that adaptive immune system. And when you're exposed to different viruses um, throughout your life, uh, you, don't, you generally don't get sick with them again because your body remembers what they are and they're able to fight that later, right? So your body, your immune system is adapting as it's exposed to different things throughout the course of your lifetime. Cool. Anybody have any questions about that? That's sort of a general overall view of how your immune system works. Yeah, we're good. All right. So let's talk a little bit about COVID-19 specifically. So COVID-19 is a coronavirus and coronaviruses are called that because they look like they have these little spike proteins that come off of them that make it look like a crown that's around the cell. So it looks like a little halo. Um, and that's where the name coronavirus comes from. The COVID-19 virus has a very specific spike protein that it presents on the outside of the cell. That's how we know that it's a COVID-19 cell. Like the flu, it's a really contagious respiratory virus but it's caused by um, a different, it's caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, not the same one that causes the flu. So it's a little bit, it's, well, it's a lot more um, contagious than the flu is. It spreads more easily and it can cause more serious illness in some people. It can also take longer for people to show symptoms from the time of exposure than the flu. And people can be contagious for longer periods of time than with the flu. And then some people are asymptomatic, probably as you know, in general, so they never show any symptoms but can still be contagious. So that's a big difference with COVID-19. There is a whole lot about it that's still unknown, right? Like there's a lot of things that, that we just don't know yet because it's so new that we are doing research all the time and it seems like something new about this virus comes out almost every day. Like today, for instance, Pfizer said that their vaccine is safe in populations from 12 to 17 years old. That's huge, right? And that is just coming out today. And, um, you know, it seems like the one shot Johnson and Johnson vaccine, now it seems like it's been around for a while, but it really was just approved for use a few weeks ago. Um, so, Everything is happening really fast um, and we're able to roll this vaccine out very quickly because of all of this collaborative research um, that's happening. This vaccine and this virus has been researched more intensely than any other vaccine in history, which is kind of neat. So COVID-19, that's what it looks like from a cellular level. Um, the symptoms that can include, it can include are fever, chills, cough, shortness of breath with potential difficulty breathing, fatigue, muscle and body aches, headache, loss of taste and smell, that's that big one that you hear a lot, sore throat, congestion, runny nose, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Um, so 
The goal here is to get everyone to be able to easily get a COVID-19 vaccine as soon as the quantity of supply of the vaccination is available widely to everyone, which seems to be increasing by the day. So depending on where you are, um, the CDC makes recommendations for how that rolls out for certain localities. Um, so depending on where you are, um, the ease of finding that vaccination is a little bit different. Some places it's easier and some places it's not. All right, so how the process works. It's a phased process, right, of getting the vaccination. You guys, I'm probably not telling you anything that you don't already know as far as the phases. Hopefully you learned a little nugget of information about what COVID-19 is. Um, but they're rolling the vaccination out um, by by different groups, right? With the goal, um, says President Biden, of May 1st, everyone being eligible everywhere. As of right now, um, 145 million vaccinations have been given out as of Saturday, which is kind of cool. Um, so we know a lot about the safety of the vaccination just based on the fact that that many millions of people have already been vaccinated. Um, that makes 27.6% of the total US population who's had at least one dose and 15.1% of the population right now that is fully vaccinated. I have had two doses, so I can actually speak personally to, um, to what it feels like to get both doses of the vaccine. Um, so I can tell you a little bit about that as we go too. Um, it, the vaccines do offer protection against the new variants. So that's great news too. Um, they appear to be able to safely vaccinate against the new variants. And if they're not perfect, they do at least offer some protection against those variants. So it's important to know that when you're making a choice about whether or not to get vaccinated. All right. So hopefully by now, um, most of the really vulnerable population has been vaccinated. Protecting our most vulnerable means that fewer new cases will result in hospitalization, hospitalizations and death. So the more we can protect our vulnerable population, the less death and hospitalization is likely to occur if we, which it seems like we may be headed for this fourth wave, that may be the difference with this fourth wave is that we may have an increase in cases, but they may be milder and may not have as many complications as before since we have worked hard to protect our most, most vulnerable population. We are still though working to vaccinate people over 75, really people over 65. Um, so, uh, and people with other underlying health issues where catching COVID-19 could really cause some complications. So, um, so there are still those who need the shot, um, but as we open up these different phases, hopefully that vaccine becomes more and more accessible to everyone so that everyone will be able to become vaccinated. These are some of the people who are at risk. It's just sort of a list of high risk populations, the critical population. Um, so you can look through that. Everything varies by jurisdiction, right? So every jurisdiction has to decide who their critical population is and who their critical population is not. Um, and, and as the vaccine becomes more and more readily available, we are less worried about, um, I mean, we're still worried about the critical population, but we're more worried about getting that shot into everyone's arms, right? As many people as we possibly can than we are about only serving the critical population because we have enough, we're starting to have enough vaccine to go around. So you taking a shot does not necessarily preclude someone else from getting their shot. Okay, so what do we know about the vaccine? So let's talk a little bit about vaccines and how vaccines work in general. So vaccines um, are, are really interesting. There are lots of different types of vaccines um, and they, they range from, I'm gonna talk to you guys about a little bit. So there are inactive vaccines. Inactive vaccines are just a killed version of a germ. Um, it's like the flu shot is that, it's a killed version of the germ. So it can't make you sick, 
Um, but it does introduce that killed version of the germ into your body so that you mount, you make antibodies. So if you're exposed to the, um, the whole version of the germ, that your body will fight that off. Uh, it's not as strong as a live vaccine, so you might need several doses, and it's why the flu shot is an annual shot, right? So, um, so that's what the flu shot is. It's an, and Hep A, polio, those are all examples of inactive vaccines. There are also live attenuated vaccines, which is a weakened form of the germ that's introduced to your body, still introducing it to your body, so your body will create antibodies to it. There are limitations for live attenuated vaccines. So if you're immunocompromised, um, this would not be a good vaccine for you because it is a weakened form of the germ, but it could make you sick, particularly, particularly if you're in an immunocompromised state. Um, one to two doses of a live attenuated vaccine though can create lifetime immunity. So it is a really effective type of vaccination. Um, so these are things like MMR, which is measles, mumps, rubella, the rotavirus, smallpox, chickenpox, and yellow fever are all examples of vaccines that are live attenuated vaccines. So just weakened versions of a germ. There's recombinant vaccines. Those are specific pieces of a germ that are introduced into your body and your body learns to fight specific pieces. It's strong and very targeted, but may need, may need booster shots. So the, a recombinant vaccine is like Hep B or the new HIV vaccine, uh, I mean, HPV, we don't have an HIV vaccine, HPV vaccine, um, yeah, whooping cough, um, men meningococcal disease, shingles is a good example of that too. Um, there are also vaccines called toxoid vaccines. Toxoid vaccines use a toxin that's made by the germ to create immunity. So you actually become immune to the toxin and not the germ itself. But if the germ creates toxins in your body, then that's a way to fight that germ off. Your immune response is to the toxin. May need a booster of that too. So then we have mRNA vaccines, which is what the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines are for COVID. So the, the way, the mechanism of action for these is that mRNA is like a messenger to your cells. Um, it gives them information to code certain proteins. It does not change your DNA. It cannot penetrate the nucleus of your DNA. So it can't penetrate that cell to be able to change any of your DNA. So the messenger RNA is just coding for proteins. And what it does for COVID-19 is it actually codes cells to produce that spike protein that we talked about before that's on the outside of the coronavirus, right? That, that specific spike protein for COVID-19. Um, and then your body recognizes that that specific protein is not supposed to be in your body and it mounts an immune response, an inflammatory response to attack that particular spike protein. So your B lymphocytes, right, that's your intelligence system, sends out your T lymphocytes to attack that particular, those cells that have that spike protein on them. Similarly, um, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is a vector vaccine, and we're going to talk about that in a second, but that vector vaccine actually puts some of that genetic material from COVID-19 into a different virus. In this case, they're using the adenoid virus, which is the virus that causes the common cold. So it's a completely modified version of that virus. And they, the, but that virus is what acts as the vector, which is the transportation module for the information from COVID-19, which also tells your cells to produce the spike protein. And because that spike protein is so specific to COVID-19, we're able to, your cells receive the instructions to make that, to code for that protein, and then your body mounts an immune response to that protein. So for Pfizer and Moderna, they both are two dose vaccinations. I got the Pfizer um, and, uh, and I got them 21 days apart. Sometimes you can feel kind of lousy after that second dose and you feel just like you would if you were fighting any other 
virus in your body, like, you know, fever, chills, aches, being really tired could be what you feel. And you feel this way because your body is busy mounting a big inflammatory response to that spike protein, right? And then it's remembering those B lymphocytes, that intelligence system is remembering what that spike protein looks like. So if you are actually exposed to COVID-19, your body can then fight off that virus without making you really sick. Um, so that's how those work. It's a really interesting way um, to be able to create vaccinations because they can be lab created. You don't need to have the virus to be able to, so it's not live attenuated, it's not a weakened version of it. It's actually lab manufactured, um, which can get it out to all over the place. Now the Pfizer and the Moderna, the mRNA vaccines have to be kept very cold and at a very certain temperature um, for them not to expire. So, and they expire. So those vaccinations need to be there. It's gonna be tough to roll those out to like third world countries because those um, really have to be kept at that certain temperature. The Johnson & Johnson, the vector vaccine does not. Um, so it doesn't require um, extra chilled freezers um, and it can be in it. Can, we can get it out to populations that are rural um, and underserved a lot more easily than we can the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. So it's really great to have these two different types of vaccines, three vaccines in total, but their mechanism of action is slightly different so that we can really get this rolled out to as many people as possible fairly quickly. Does anybody have any questions about that so far? No, we are still rolling. All right, guys, we'll keep on going. Then. All right, so all of the vaccines are given in the upper deltoid muscle of your arm. I can tell you that I didn't even feel it when I got my vaccination. Um, and, you know, I did feel it later. My arm was pretty sore, pretty darn sore later on in the day, um, but it was gone within 24 hours. After my second dose, um, I was tired, but I didn't get the same side effects that some other people get. And I definitely left there thinking, huh, I really hope that my body is mounting the correct immune system, immune response, because I don't feel terrible. Um, but but I didn't. I did feel tired. Um, and Carrie got hers and she said she did feel kind of terrible. So um, it just depends from person to person, right? We're all different. So we're all going to be affected a little bit differently. But the most common side effects include pain at the injection site, muscle ache, headache, fatigue and nausea. Very, very rarely people have had an allergic reaction. I mean, it is rare, but reportable um, to the first dose of the vaccination. And it is recommended that if you are, if you have an allergic reaction, that you don't get the second dose. On the CDC website, you can look up the exact um, ingredients for each vaccine so that you know that if you are allergic to any of those things in the vaccine that you probably sh at least should have a conversation with your healthcare provider before you um, elect to get vaccinated. Another thing that I learned is that this was um, something that was going around I saw on social media was that if you had an allergic reaction, you should be really careful at places like the walk-in clinics because um, they don't have the correct ability to um, to respond to an anaphylactic reaction. And it turns out they do. So every place that is offering any sort of vaccination also has to have the capability to take care of you should you have an allergic reaction to the vaccine. So they're all staffed by healthcare professionals and they all have um, like EpiPens and, um, and AEDs and everything that you might need on hand in case someone does have a terrible allergic reaction. It has been extremely rare. All right, you can't get COVID from the vaccine. You also can't get the common cold from the vaccine, right? It's a whole modified, um, the vector vaccine is, is a completely modified version of that virus, so you can't get that. Most people's um, side effects were gone within um, one to two days. 
I know mine were, I felt tired, but I, I felt fine after two days. Um, so it was, it was really not a big deal for me. I know that for some other people, um, they felt pretty rotten after that second dose. Um, but I do think that's a good thing. That means your immune system is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. And it means that, um, that, that, that you'll be ready if you're ever exposed to COVID-19. Um, and it doesn't last long. Like for everyone that I know that felt crummy in one to two days, they felt totally fine. So feeling crummy, I think for one to two days is a lot better than feeling crummy for a long time when you get COVID. All right. So now what can vaccinated people do? Fully vaccinated means you are two weeks post complete dosage. It takes about two weeks for your body's immune system to create those antibodies from that second dose or from the first dose if you get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. But then you can gather indoors with other fully vaccinated people without a mask. Um, for example, my whole family is vaccinated, which is really exciting. And so we are actually gonna celebrate Easter together. We're gonna do it outdoors but we're gonna do it for the first time in a year and a half that since we've seen each other um, because everyone is vaccinated and that's pretty exciting. Um, so it feels like some sort of semblance of normal. Um, you can gather indoors with unvaccinated people from one other family without masks, unless one of those people is at a severe risk from complications. If there are more than one group of people that's outside of your household, you should still wear a mask, you should still socially distance, um, and you should still um, really use, use, use caution. If you're exposed to COVID-19, you don't need to quarantine or get tested unless you display symptoms. The CDC also came out today and said that the vaccine is protecting people from COVID-19, that vaccinated people are not displaying symptoms and not testing positive for COVID-19. That's exciting to hear too. So what should vaccinated people then continue to do? So once you get your vaccine, you should continue to wear a mask and you should continue to social distance at least six feet apart in public spaces. It's still a good idea to avoid crowds and poorly ven ventilated spaces. Um, gathering of unvaccinated people from multiple households is still not a great idea. Um, and delaying domestic travel is still part of the CDC guidelines. Um, and if you, if, it, if it's not possible for you to delay any kind of travel, um, look on the CDC's website there. It is a wealth of information about this vac the about COVID and about the vaccine. Um, and, and they can, they can give you guidelines about what you should do if you are, if you do need to travel. One of the big fears right now about this fourth wave is that um, one of the big things came um, into, oh wait, oh, there's a question, came in on the last slide. If you have the vaccine, can you carry it to someone who is not vaccinated? If you have the vaccine, can you carry it? I don't understand that question. Carter, it came yeah. to me. I, I think it sounds like what the person's asking is, okay, so say you're vaccinated, right? Yeah. And you go get together or see someone and they happen to not be yet because they're not yet or by choice, whatever that might be. Um, would you be a carrier even though you are vaccinated and not sick and not displaying symptoms? Sounds like what that question so is. Today, just today, and so I don't know all of the information around that because it is really new information. The CDC is saying that vaccinated people are not carrying COVID. Um, that that's their research and that's what they came out and said today. They are not testing positive. Um, if, but if you are vaccinated and you do get COVID, then yes, you can carry it. I mean, ostensibly you could give it to someone else. Um, the vaccinations are like between 95 and 90 and a hundred percent effective, really somewhere in there. Um, so if you're vaccinated, um, likely you don't have COVID. 
if you're fully vaccinated. Now, you could definitely be exposed to COVID and then go get your vaccination and then display symptoms because you were exposed to it before you got vaccinated or before you're fully vaccinated, right? So fully vaccinated is two weeks after that second dose. So you're still real vul really vulnerable from that first dose all the way through until two weeks after your second dose. So depending on the vaccine that you get, it could be anywhere from two weeks if you got Johnson & Johnson to like six weeks if you got Moderna because the second shot is four weeks after the first shot and then it's two weeks after that. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense and answers your question. If not, yeah, definitely. I, it made sense me to me. So hopefully it, 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 hopefully it does to the cool. person whose question that was. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So you definitely still, and all of this information is so new that what I'm telling you today could be completely different tomorrow if some new guideline comes out. Um, I was at actually at my local hospital earlier today and the nurse there was telling me that um, they expect the pre-procedure guidelines to, to come out to be different potentially by the end of the week, which is funny because it's Wednesday. And so by Friday, their information might be different where if you're having a procedure, you don't have to have a COVID test. So, um, so it's just a, everything is changing. So my, my other advice to you is to continue to monitor the CDC website because it has the best information and the most current information that's updated. And they always say at the top of each of their, um, each page on that website, the date that it was most recently updated and it's it's interesting because if you look at things that were updated on like march 3rd you think man this information seems old and it, march 3rd was not that long ago but yet now the information is kind of old right and then there's a lot that was just updated um this week so like i know that as of march 29th 145 million people have had at least one dose which is great all right so vaccines and work, can an employer require a vaccine? They can, um, and you guys can read this slide and, um, and, and decide whether, you know, if you have any questions about that. Um, it's a good idea to get a vaccination. We have discovered they are extremely safe um, and very few side effects have been noted that are really serious, yet there are a lot of serious side effects from actually getting COVID, right? Half a million people have died from this. So it is really important to know your facts, to get vaccinated, and, um, and to understand that piece, right? Understand the facts and, uh, and make your decision based on that. So we've got three vaccines, right? They're safe. Um, most phases of the vaccine schedule are rolling out now with the goal of having everyone eligible by May the 1st. So that's coming right up, if you think about it. Um, and there is a lot of research that's continuing and ongoing about new vaccinations like the AstraZeneca vaccination that was a little bit controversial in Europe, but studies have shown, including some extensive ones in the United States, that that has been, it's, it's a safe vaccine to get. Um, so that may become available to us as well. That is the most widely available vaccine in Europe um, currently. So, um, I think the thing, the thing to know is to be able to really speak to vaccinations with some assurance of fact and not, not spreading misinformation. Um, so if someone comes to you with something that seems to be logical about the vaccination, but that maybe you have a question about, it's a really great idea to go to the CDC's website and to find that information out. Um, also, this is a really great time to establish a good relationship with your healthcare provider. Uh, there are lots of things that you should want to talk to your healthcare provider about throughout the course of your lifetime. But if you don't have a regular healthcare provider, this is a great time to, um, to establish a good relationship with one because these are great questions to actually ask them and to understand your personal history, um, because all of us are different 
Another question, um, what have you seen, read, or heard about COVID affecting children? And if all adults in a household are vaccinated, should they still stay home and not make changes if children are not yet vaccinated? So as of today, um, what I know is that Pfizer has said that their vaccination is safe, um, and there are a lot of clinical trials going on right now in children. Um, they are saying that their vaccination is safe for children from 12 to 17. Right now, their vaccination, the, just the Pfizer vaccination, vaccination is approved for ages 16 and up. So I would imagine that probably starting this summer or into the fall, that the Pfizer vaccine will become available for children as young as 12. I also read that the vaccine um, still needs more research, but that so far it has done very well in pregnant women. Um, and so I think that we'll have to watch the rest of that research come in, um, but that's a, those are all great questions for your healthcare provider. If you are fully vaccinated, the adults in your family are fully vaccinated, then you're, you're okay to go do the things that the CDC, sa CDC says that you can do, even if you have children at home. Does that answer that question? It's always still good to be cautious, um, just because all of this is new, all of the research is new. The vaccines are actually not new. Interestingly, the vector vaccine, which is what the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is, has been around for a long time and actually has been um, used in Ebola outbreaks in parts of Africa. So a vector vaccine is not even a new given vaccine. The mRNA technology has been around for decades and has been used specifically in research um, to be able to, um, to, to target specific cancer cells um, and might be a way for, um, for us to have better cancer treatments too. So all of this research is has been ongoing. It's not new because of COVID, but it's a much bigger, faster rollout because of COVID. Uh, someone made a comment about being vaccinated and would they, they be able to carry the antibodies to their child if they are nursing? That is an interesting point. So passive um, immunity is something that mothers do pass to their nursing babies. Um, and it is, it protects against certain things that the mother is um, is immune to, but it's only lasts for a short period of time. And I'm not really sure how long that time is, but I do know that that is the best example of, of passive immunity or borrowed immunity, where, um, where you actually can borrow an immunity from your mom while you're nursing. Um, so that is a great question um, and one that would be a great one for your pediatrician. Is it true that the swab or the vaccine can cause cancer? No, there's no correlation that I know of that I've seen that the swab or the vaccine could be cancer causing. Again, like they work in very specific ways. Um, and so, and the swab is just kind of like being swabbed for strep throat or for anything else that you eat, the flu, something else that you would be swabbed for just to test. But no, it would not be able to cause, to cause cancer. It doesn't introduce um, any changed or cancer-causing cells to your body, so I don't, I don't think that would be the case. Does anyone else have questions? I've talked for about forty minutes here, and I want to make sure that I give plenty of time for you guys to ask questions that you have. Can the vaccine cause any type of infertility? No, the vaccine is really just targeting the spike protein that is on the outside of a coronavirus. It's on the outside of this specific coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So mounting an immune response. So the, the way that, in, that an immune response works in your body is that there's good inflammation that we talked about, right? And there's also bad inflammation. So bad inflammation is chronic inflammation. If you are chronically stressed, um, or if you're, uh, if you're, if you don't sleep well chronically, it can cause sort of a chronic inflammation in your body. 
that can cause lots of different issues um, and it can affect your ability to um, to be able to fight off other sicknesses that you might be exposed to but the vaccine itself is not going to cause chronic infl inflammation which then might cause infertility what other questions do you guys have these are good questions so far I think the big takeaway, um, hopefully from today, was that everyone makes a decision about whether or not to get vaccinated for a very personal reason. So if anyone is on the fence about why they should be vaccinated, helping someone to find that personal reason is helpful. So when people have concerns, it's best to listen, to understand, to ask questions that might help you understand why someone might be hesitant and then to be able to answer those specifically um, with grace and, you know, and, and, and empathy. Let's see, we have a couple of more questions here. Um, so COVID does not live long on surfaces. It's mostly in the air. It is a respiratory virus. Um, and it is in droplets and it can live in the air for, um, for hours. Uh, so if you sneeze or if you cough, this is why masks are so effective, um, because if you sneeze or cough, it doesn't send your droplets all into the air um, and you're also not inhaling other people's. There is some research I know about it living on surfaces. And I think if you wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands, hand sanitizer, all of that, um, you're you're pretty protected. Let's see. How does the vaccine potential potentially impact somebody on an immune suppressant drug such as Humira? That's a great question. Additionally, is there any correlation between receiving the vaccine and a patient going into AFib? I don't know of any correlation between the vaccine and a patient going into AFib. I don't know why it would affect um, atrial fibrillation is when your heart has sort of um, some, elect some additional electrical impulses that cause it to um, be a little bit confused on how to beat, right? So it makes it spasm. Um, when you go into AFib, it causes an irregular rhythm. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that specifically and you would want to ask a healthcare provider that specifically your healthcare provider or your um the healthcare the cardiologist of your loved one if it's a loved one that has afib um that would be an important question but i i don't know of any mechanism of action on why it would cause a patient to go into afib so it doesn't in my i can't make a leap between the two in my mind um, and then how does the vaccine potentially impact someone on immune on immune suppressant drugs um, that is a, that's a very good question. And it's one that you would want to work with your healthcare provider on. Um, I know that there is, um, I don't, I don't know if your body would have a harder time creating immunity to COVID-19 because you're on an immunosuppressant drug. Um, I do know that, um, prior to being vaccinated, my son has some autoimmune conditions and they wanted to put him on Otesla for um, his psoriasis, but he's 19 and they don't want to put an immunocompromised 19 year old. Um, that is the population of people right now that seem to be generating this potential fourth wave. It's younger people um, who are traveling and being exposed to, um, to COVID like Florida for spring break, right? Um, so um, I know that they don't want to put them on an immunosuppressant drug until they have been vaccinated, but I'm not really sure about the vaccination impact on in someone who's already on an immunosuppressant drug. So that's another really great question to talk to your specific doctor about because they know your situation better than I do. 
can I talk more to the various variants and the vaccine covering those? Will we need a booster shot? So I'm not sure. Um, I know that the, um, the, the latest data, so the variants are relatively new. Um, we do have that UK variant in all 50 of our states. So there is some research about that. Um, and it does, it is proving that the vaccinations are effective against those variants. How effective? I don't know, but I do know that they are showing that they are effective for the variants. Uh, that's a great question about a booster shot. Like, could this be something that we need a booster shot of every year? Maybe. Um, is the other great thing about the mRNA technology for these vaccines is that there is potential to create a vaccine um, using mRNA technology that would cover a whole host of different diseases in one shot. So that's really cool about the lab generated um, vaccination process with mRNA and with vector vaccines. Um, so so stay, I, my best advice there is stay tuned. You may end up needing a booster shot and, um, and you may not. And really right now the Pfizer and the Moderna you do get a shot and a booster shot, right? That second shot is giving you that, your immune system, that boost. Well, we have ability to choose which version of the vaccine we receive. That's another good question. And I don't know the answer to that. I did not have a choice. They, um, when I showed up at the place where I got mine, they were giving out both Moderna and Pfizer and they handed me a card and then someone else looked at it and said, oh, you got Pfizer, you go over here. Um, and so I, I, I do think you can probably choose to get Johnson and Johnson instead of Moderna or Pfizer, um, but it just depends on your locality and your how your jurisdiction is rolling out the the vaccine. Would we need a yearly vaccine? Right, we just don't know. If you already had COVID nineteen, how long do you have to wait to get the vaccine? I have heard thirty days, and I've also heard sixty days, and I've also heard ninety days. So that's another great question to ask your doctor. I do think that if you've already had COVID-19, you should still get vaccinated to make sure that you have enough antibodies to fight any further infection. Um, I do know people that have had it twice. Not many, but I do. What if you have a bleeding disorder when you get one of these vaccines? Um, again, like for your specific situation, talk to your healthcare provider. I can speak personally um, that I, um, I have a clotting disorder and I was able to get my vaccine just fine. Um, but I don't know the answer to that. And again, like your specific situation, um, is going to be something that your healthcare provider would know. And that I really don't, because it has a lot to do with not just one thing that you might have, but what that whole story is about you. Over 102 plus fully vaccinated people have been infected with COVID. Uh, Carter, I can yes. um, I can also chime in on the sure. question if you want, just just a personal experience. But I think it yeah. help people on the question about I think it was Humira, but in general, immune suppressant drugs. Um, uh -huh. So I, I take an immunosuppressing drug. I don't take it every day, but I get infusions from time to time each year. And um, my doctor, I had to work specifically with, as you're saying, Carter, specifically with my doctor for my case, because it depends on how often you might take that medication or get the infusion. It also, apparently, I learned, depends on the amount you get. Everybody gets different amounts, whether it's a pill or an infusion or whatever it is. So I, I, I did get both of my vaccines, as you mentioned, Carter. I did have a few. Um, a few side effects from the second dose, but my getting the vaccine, I had to work with my doctor because the timing of it versus the timing of when I take my medication versus the amount of my medication that I get all played into my special case. So I think, you know, no matter what the, the drug is or the situation, still everybody will, will be different in that. And I would definitely, before you, you know, decide to go get it, talk to your doctor about if the timing matters or a certain one of the vaccine matters as well. Absolutely. Hopefully that's helpful there. <laughs> yeah, totally. I think that's super helpful. I think the more people can speak from personal experience too, the more helpful it is um, just to relate to everyone who's 
who's now going through, should I or should I not? And I did see the comment, um, someone made a comment about people who have been hospitalized um, after getting COVID, after getting the vaccine. And I would um, make sure that you um, just make sure your information is coming from the correct source. Like make sure it's coming from a .gov, like the CDC's actual website. Um, just so you know that you have the exact correct information and it's not coming from some other media source. What other questions do you guys have? It says right now in New York, when you sign up for the vaccination, the New York.gov site gives you the information on what shot you have scheduled for. So, um, so that will help you just sort of know which shot you would be getting. I know it's really scary to have all of this information out there and to have it all to be changing so very quickly. Um, and, and really my best, best advice, um, and, and, and if there's just one takeaway from this whole thing today is to check the CDC website, check your sources, talk to your doctor, and really understand, talk to your family about what your plan is regarding your vaccination and your shot. Um, I think that that way, everybody, you know, feels a lot better about just the open and real communication about, about what it is. And let's be empathetic to each other. I'm going to hang out in case you guys have any other questions, um, but I really appreciate you having me here today. It's been great to chat with you guys. Y'all have had really wonderful questions, and uh, I hope that I've been able to at least bring some information to you that you may not have known before. Thank you guys. I'm going to stop recording.